Somebody had robbed old Alice, which meant the police would come sniffing around the boat, asking all the ship workers if they knew anything about it. Joe's reputation was spotless. He'd been working on the ships in Fells Point for nearly two years and had never given anybody any trouble. But still, whenever a boat was robbed, all the black dock workers were rounded up and questioned. Joe was tired of it. He was always jumpy around police or anyone in uniform. Even the appearance of a postman had once sent him running behind a lace curtain. Ma'aku said he'd been like this since their days in the woods, running from catchers from town to town until they'd hit the safe house in Maryland. Cover for me, would you, Poot? Joe asked his friend. But he knew the police wouldn't miss him. They, could tell, they couldn't tell one black face from another. Poot would answer when they called his own name, and then answer when they called Joe's too, and they wouldn't know the difference. Joe jumped off the boat and looked behind him at the beautiful Chesapeake Bay, at the large, imposing ships that lined the Fells Point shipyards. He loved the look of those boats, loved that his hands helped build and maintain them. But Ma'aku always said it was bad juju, him and all the other freed black men working on ships. She said there was something evil about them building up the things that had brought them to America in the first place, the very things that had tried to drag them under. Joe walked down Market Street and bought some pig's feet from Jim at the corner store near the museum. As he was leaving, a horse broke free from its buggy and ran wild, nearly trampling an old white woman who had been lifting her skirt, just about to step into the street. You all right, ma'am? Joe asked, running over to her and offering his arm. She looked dazed for a second, but then she smiled at Joe. Fine, thank you, she said. He continued on. Anna would still be cleaning house with Ma'aku. He knew he should go over there and help the two women, with a what with Anna being pregnant again and Ma'aku being so old the never-ending coughs and aches had set in. But it had been too long since he let himself enjoy Baltimore. The cool sea breeze, the black men, some slave but some free as can be, who worked and lived and played around him. Joe had been a slave once. He was only a baby then. And yet every time he saw a slave in Baltimore, he felt like he remembered. Every time Joe saw a slave in Baltimore, he saw himself saw what his life would have been like had Ma'aku not taken him to freedom. His free papers named him Kojo Freeman, Free Man. Half the ex-slaves in Baltimore's had the name. Tell a lie long enough and it was ill turned to the truth. Joe only knew the South from the stories Ma'aku told him, same way he knew his mother and father, Ness and Sam. As stories and nothing more. He didn't miss what he didn't know, what he couldn't feel in his hands or his heart. Baltimore was tangible. It wasn't an endless crops and whipping. It was the port, the ironworks, the trail ro railroads. It was the pig's feet Kojo was eating, the smiles of his seven children with number eight on the way. It was Anna, who'd married him when he was just 16 and he 19, had worked nearly every day of the 19 years since. Thinking of Anna again, Joe decided to swing by the Matheson house, where she and Ma were cleaning that day. He bought a flower from old Bess on the corner of North and 16th, and, holding it, he felt like he could finally forget the thought of the police on his ship. "'Why, if it ain't my husband Joe coming up the walk,' Anna said when she saw him. She was sweeping the porch with what looked like a new broom. The handle was a handsome brown, only a few shades darker than her own skin, and the bristles all stood at attention. Ma'aku always liked to tell them that in the Gold Coast, brooms had no handles. The body was the handle, and it moved and bent much easier than a stick ever could. "'Brought you something,' Joe said, handing her the flower. She took it and breathed it in and smiled. The stalk hit her stomach just where her belly started to strain against her dress. Joe put his hand there and rubbed. "'Where's Ma?' he asked. "'Inside, doing the kitchen.' Joe kissed his wife and took the broom from her hands. "'You go on and help her now,' he said, giving her butt a squeeze and a push as he sent her inside." It was the butt that had done it 19 years ago and was still doing it now. He had seen it coming around Strawberry Alley and had followed it a whole four blocks. It was mesmerizing, the way it moved, independent of the rest of her body, as though operating under the influence of another brain entirely. One cheek knocking into the other cheek so that that cheek had to swing out before knocking back. When he was seven years old, Joe had asked Ma'aku what a man was supposed to do when he liked a woman, and she had laughed. His ma had never been like the other mothers. She was a little strange, a little off, still dreaming of the country she'd been ripped from years and years before. She could often be found looking out at the water, looking as if she would jump in, try to find her way home. Why, Kojo, in the Gold Coast, they say if you like a woman, you have to go to her father with an offering. Back then, Joe had been in love with a girl named Mirabelle, 
And in church the next Sunday, he'd brought her father a frog that he'd caught by the water the night before. And Ma'aku had laughed and laughed and laughed until the pastor and the father said she was teaching Joe the ways of old African witchcraft and kicked him out of the congregation. With Anna, Joe simply followed the sway of her butt until it stopped still. He'd gone up to her and seen her face, her sweet caramel skin and black, black hair, as dark and as long as a horse's tail, always worn in a single braid. He told her his name was Joe and asked if he could walk with her a ways. She said yes, and they walked the whole length of Baltimore. It wasn't until months later that Joe learned Anna had gotten in trouble with her mother that night, having skipped out on all the chores she had promised to do. The Mathesons were an old white family. Mr. Matheson's father's house had once been a stop at the Underground Railroad, and he'd taught his son to always lend a helpful hand. Mrs. Matheson was the one with the family money, and when the two had gotten together, they'd bought a large house and employed Anna, Ma'aku, and a host of other black folk from in and around Baltimore. The house was two stories and ten rooms. It took hours to clean, and the Mathesons liked it spotless. Kojo took up some of the work that, that day, and while washing the windows in the drawing room, he could hear Matheson and the other abolitionists talking. If California joins the Union as a free state, President Taylor will leave his, have his hands full with the Southern secessionists, Matheson said. And Maryland will be caught in the middle, another voice said. That's why we got to do all we can do to make sure mo more slaves are emancipated right here in Baltimore. They could go on like this for hours, talking this way. In the beginning, Joe had liked to listen to them. It had given him hope, seeing all those powerful white people take up for him and his. But the more years went on, the more he knew that even kind-hearted people like the ones in the Matheson house could only do so much. When they finished cleaning the house, Joe, Anna, and Ma'aku headed back towards their little apartment on 24th Street. My back, oh, my back, Ma said, clutching at the body part that had been paining her for years now. She turned to Joe and in twee said, haven't we grown tired? It was an old, worn expression for an old and worn feeling. Joe nodded and gave the woman his hand to help her up the stairs. Inside, the kids were playing. Agnes, Beulah, Cato, Daly, Urias, Felicity, and Gracie. It seemed like he and Anna were going to have one child for every letter in the alphabet. They would teach their children to read those letters, grow them up to be the kind of people who would teach those letters to other people. Now everyone in the house called the new baby H as a placeholder until it came out and brought its name along with it. Being a good father felt like a debt Joe owed to his parents, who couldn't get free. He used to spend many nights trying to conjure up an image of his own father. Was he brave, tall, kind, smart? Was he good and fair man? What kind of father would he have been if he had ever gotten a chance to be a father free? Now Joe spent most of his nights with his ear against his wife's barely there stomach, trying to get to know baby H a little before it arrived. He had made a promise to Anna that he would be there for them, the way his own father had not been able to be there for them. And Anna, who had never wanted her own father to be there for her, knowing the kind of man he was and the kind of trouble his presence would have brought, had just smiled and patted his back. But Joe meant what he had said. He studied his children, the few hours every night that he got to see them before they went to bed or every morning before they went off to the docks. Agnes was the helper. He had never known a kinder, gentler spirit not Anna and certainly not his world-weary mother. Beulah was a beauty, but she didn't know yet. Cato was soft for a boy, and Joe tried every day to put a little grit into him. Dally was a fighter, and Urias was too often his target. Felicity was so shy, she wouldn't tell you her own name if you asked her. And Gracie was a round ball of love. His life with them, with Anna and Ma and the kids, was all that he had ever wanted on those days he'd spent as a lonely child going from safe house to safe house, job to job, trying to help the woman he called mother do the mothering work she hadn't asked for, but never complained about. Ma'aku started coughing, and Agnes came over right away to help her into the bed. The apartment had two rooms, one for Joe and Anna, separated by a curtain, and one for everyone and everything else. Ma'aku went down onto the mattress with a heavy sigh, and within minutes she was coughing and snoring in equal measure. Gracie, the baby, was pawing at the leg of Joe's trousers. Daddy, Daddy! Joe swooped down and picked her up in one arm as easily as if she were the toolbox he'd left on the boat. Pretty soon she'd be too big for babying, probably just in time for the new baby to come. Soon, Agnes and Anna had gotten all the little kids to sleep, and Agnes was finally sleeping herself. 
Joe was sitting in the bedroom with the curtain drawn when Anna came in, rubbing the belly that was so small it was little more than a feeling. Police came by the boat today, said someone had robbed her, Joe said. Anna was taking off her clothes and folding them, then placing them on the chair that sat beside their mass mattress. She would wear the same ones tomorrow. She hadn't had the time to do the wash that week, and she hadn't had the money to do it the week before. So all she could do was hope the children didn't smell when they went off to the Christian school. Did it scare you? she asked. And Joe stood, quick as a flash, and grabbed her into his arms, pulling her down into the mattress with him. Ain't nothing scare me, woman, he said, while she laughed and thrashed, pretending to bite him off. They kissed, and whatever clothes Anna hadn't gotten to, Joe made quick work of removing. He tasted her and could feel more than hear the pleasure it sent through her body like a current, the way she stifled her moans so the kids wouldn't wake up, an expert at this after many nights and seven children. They worked quickly and quietly together, hoping the dark would mask their motions if one of the children happened to be peering through the curtain, unable to sleep. Joe grabbed onto Anna's butt with both of his hungry hands. As long as he lived, it would always be a pleasure and a gift to fill his hands with the weight of her flesh. The next morning, Joe went back to work on Alice. Poot came by to split his breakfast with Joe, a little cornbread and some fish. Did they come around? Joe asked. Earlier that morning, he had gotten an oakum ready for the deck, soaking the hemp and pine tar. He twisted it like rope, laying it down in the seams between the planks. Joe had been working with the same tools since he first started caulking, his very own iron and mallet. He loved the sound those two tools made together when he laid the oakum into the seams, tapping the iron gently to coerce the oakum to stay, the seams to fill, the boat to keep from leaking. Yeah, they came. Just asked the usual questions, though. Wasn't bad. I hear they found the man that done it. Poot was born free, lived in Baltimore his whole life. He'd worked on Alice for about a year, and before that, he'd worked on just about every other ship in the port. He was one of the best caulkers around. People said that he could just put his ear to a ship, and it would tell him where it needed work. Joe had come up under him, and because of that, he knew just about everything there was to know about ships. He paid the hull, spreading hot pitch over the whole thing, and then covering it with copper plates. When he was first starting out, Joe had almost died heating the, the pitch. The fire had been magnificent and so hot it was like the devil's breath, and before Joe knew it, it had started to chase the wood of the deck. He looked down at all that water floating in the bay and then back up at the fire that was threatening to take the whole boat down with it, and he'd asked for a miracle. That miracle was Poot. Quick as can be, Poot had put out the fire and calmed the boss down by telling him that if, that if Joe couldn't stay, he wouldn't either. Now, whenever Joe lit a fire on the boat, he knew how to tend it. Joe had just finished the hull and was wiping the sweat out of his eyes when he saw Anna standing and waving from the dock. It was a rare for her to meet him on a workday, because he usually finished before she did, but he was pleased to see her. As he grabbed his tools and started walking toward her, he realized something was wrong. Mr. Matheson says for you to come to the house quick as you can, she said. She was wringing her hand handkerchief in her hands, a nervous habit he detested, for seeing it always had the effect of making him nervous, too. Is Ma all right? He asked, grabbing her hands in his and shaking them till they finally stilled. Yes. Then what is it? I don't know, she said. He looked at her hard, but could see that she was telling him the truth. She was nervous because Matheson had never asked to see Joe before, not in the seven years that she and Ma had been cleaning the house for him, and she didn't know what it could mean that he was asking for her now. They walked a few miles to the Matheson house so quickly that the contents of Joe's toolbox rattled uncomfortably against the box walls. Joe was walking a little ahead of Anna, and he could hear the patter of her small feet struggling to stay in step with his long legs. When they reached the house, Ma'aku was waiting on the porch, her cough their only welcome from her. She and Anna led Joe into the parlor, where Matheson and a handful of other white men were sitting on the plush white couches, the cushions so full they looked like small hills or the backs of elephants. Kojo, Matheson said, standing to shake his hand. He had heard Ma'aku call Joe that once and ask them what it meant. When Ma explained that it was a shanty name for a boy born on a Monday, he clapped his hands together as though hearing a good song and insisted on Joe calling Joe by his full name every time he saw him. Taking away your name is the first step, he said somberly, so somberly that Joe hadn't felt it wise to ask what he was thinking. The first step to what? Mr. Matheson, please have a seat. Mr. Matheson said, pointing to an empty white chair. Joe suddenly felt nervous. His trousers were covered in dry pitch, so black it looked like hundreds of holes lined them. Joe worried the pitch would stay in the chair, making it so that Anna and Ma'aku would have more work to do the next day when they came in, if they came in at all. I'm so sorry to bring you all the way over here, but my colleagues have informed me of some very troubling news. 
A fatter white man cleared his throat, and Joe watched the, the jiggle of his neck as he spoke. We've been hearing about a new law being drafted by the South and the Free Soilers, and if it was to pass, law enforcement would be required to arrest any alleged runaway slave in the North and send them back to the South, no matter how long ago they escaped. The men were all watching him, waiting for him to react, and so he nodded. My concern is for you and your mother, Mr. Matheson said. And Joe looked over to the door where Anna had been standing just moments ago. She was probably back to the cleaning by now, worried about whatever it was Matheson had to say to Joe. As runaways, you might have more trouble than Anna and the children, who are free in their own right. Joe nodded. He couldn't imagine who would be looking for him or Ma'aku after all these years. Joe didn't even know the name or the face of his old master. All Ma could remember was that Ness had called him the devil. You should get your family further north. Mr. Matheson said. New York, Canada even. If this thing passes, there's no telling what kind of chaos it'll cause. Are they going to fire me? Anna asked. They were sitting on their mattress later that night, after the children had all gone to sleep, and Joe was finally able to explain to her what Matheson had called him over for. No, they just want to warn us, is all. But your ma's old master died. Ruthie told us, remember? Joe remembered. Anna's cousin Ruthie had sent word from the plantation to another safe house, and finally to Ma'aku that the man who had owned her land, her had died, and they had all breathed easier that night. Mr. Matheson say that don't matter. His people can still get her if they want to. What about me and the kids? Joe shrugged. Anna's master had fathered her and then sent her and her mother free. She had real free papers, not forged ones like Joe and Ma'aku. The kids had all been born right there in Baltimore, free. No one would be looking for them. It's just me and Ma that gotta worry. Don't you be thinking about this, nun. As for Ma'aku, Joe knew she would never leave Baltimore. Unless she could go back to the Gold Coast. There would be no new countries for her, not Canada, not even paradise if it existed on Earth. Once the woman had decided to get three free, she had also decided to stay free. When he was a child, Joe would often marvel at the knife Ma'aku always kept tucked inside her wrapper which she had been keeping inside her wrapper since her days as an Ashanti slave, then as an American slave, then finally free. The older Joe got, the more he understood about the woman he called Ma, the more he understood that sometimes staying free required unimaginable sacrifice. In the other room, Beulah started whimpering in her sleep. The child had night terrors. They came at unpredictable intervals, one month here, two days there, some days, they were so bad, she would wake herself up to the sound of her own screams, or she'd have scratches along her arms from where she fought invisible battles. Other days, she slept as still as death, tears streaming down her face. And the next day, when asked what she dreamed about, she'd always shrugged and said, nothing. This day, Joe looked out and saw a little girl's legs start to move, maybe bend at the knee, an outward kick, repeat. Beulah was running. Maybe this is where it started, Joe thought. Maybe Beulah was seeing something more clearly on the nights she had these dreams, a little black child fighting in her sleep against an opponent she couldn't name come morning. Because in the light, that opponent looked just like the world around her. Intangible evil. Unspeakable unfairness. Beulah ran in her sleep. Ran like she'd stolen something, when really, she had done nothing other than accept the peace. The clarity that came with dreaming. Yes, Joe thought. This was where it started. But where, then, did it end? Joe decided to keep his family in Baltimore. Anna was too pregnant to haul him up from the city, to which they were all rooted, and Baltimore still felt safe. People kept whispering about the law. A few families even made moves, packing up and heading north for fear that the law would pass. Old Bess, who sold the flowers on North Street, went. So did Everett, John, and Dontham, who worked on the Alice. Damn shame, Poot said, the day three Irishmen walked into the boat to replace them. You ever think about leaving Poot? Joe asked. Poot snorted. They gon' bury me in Baltimore, Joe. One way or another, they gon' throw my body down into the Chesapeake Bay. Joe knew he meant it. Poot always said that Baltimore was a great city to be a black man in. There were black porters and teachers, preachers and huskers. A free man didn't have to be a servant or a coach driver. He could make something with his own hands. He could fix something, sell something. He could build something up from the ground and send it out to sea. Poot had taken up caulking when he was only a teenager, and he'd often joked that the only thing he liked better than holding a mallet was holding a woman. He was married, but he had no children, no son to teach his trade to. The ships were his pride. He would never leave Baltimore. 
and for the most part, everyone else in Baltimore stayed put too. They were tired of running and used to waiting, so they waited to see what would come. Anna's belly continued to swell. Baby H was making itself known every day with ferocious kicks and punches to the side of Anna's gut. H is going to be a boxer, 10-year-old Cato said, resting his ear against his mother's stomach. nuh -uh, Anna said. There won't be no violence in this house. Five minutes later, Dally kicked Urias in the shins, and Anna spanked him so hard he winced every time he sat down that day. Agnes turned 16 and took a job cleaning the Methodist church on Caroline Street and Beulah relished her new role as oldest child in the house for one hour of every evening before Agnes returned home from work. Timmy said that he and Pastor John ain't going nowhere, Agnes reported one night. It was August 1850, and Baltimore had taken on a sticky heat. Agnes would come home every night with sweat licking her upper lip, her neck, her forehead. Timmy was the pastor's son, and every day Joe and the rest of the family were subjected to Agnes's reports on what Timmy had thought, done, or said that day. So I guess that means you ain't going nowhere either, Anna said with a smirk, and Agnes huffed out of the house. She said it was in search of some chocolate for the kids, but they all knew what Anna that Anna had struck a nerve. Ma'aku laughed as the door slammed. That child don't know nothing about love, she said. Her laugh turned into a cough, and she had to bend forward to let the cough fall out. Joe kissed Anna's forehead and looked at Ma. What did you know about love, Ma? he asked, talking over the laugh where she left it. Ma wagged her finger at him. Don't go asking me what I know and don't know, she said. You ain't the only one who ever touched or been touched by somebody. It was Anna's turn to laugh, and Joe dropped the hand that he had been squeezing, feeling a bit betrayed. Who, Ma? Ma shook her head slowly. Don't matter. Two weeks later, Timmy came by the docks to ask Joe for Agnes's hand in marriage. You know a trade, boy? Joe asked. I'm gonna be a preacher like my daddy, Timmy said. Joe grunted. He'd been to a church only once since the day he and Ma'aku were kicked out for witchcraft, and that was the day of his own wedding. If Agnes married this preacher's son, he'd have to go again for her wedding, and then who knew how many more times. The day they'd walked the five miles home from the Baptist church after Joe had given Mirabelle's father the frog, Joe had cried and cried. Ma'aku let him carry on for a few minutes, and then she snatched his ear up with her hand, dragged the boy into the alley, looked at him hard, and said, What you crying for, boy? Pastor says we was doing African witchcraft. He wasn't old enough to know what that meant, but he was old enough to know shame, and that day he was full up to his ears with it. Ma'aku spit behind her left shoulder, something she only did when truly disgusted. Who told you to cry for that? She said. And he shrugged his shoulders, tried to keep his nose from running, for it seemed to make her more angry. I tell you, if they had not chosen the white man's god instead of the gods of the Ashanti, they could not say these things to me. Joe knew he was supposed to nod, and so he did. She continued. The white man's god is just like the white man. He thinks he's the only god. Just like the white man thinks he's the only man. But the only reason he is god instead of Inyame or Chawuku or whoever is because we let him be. We do not fight him. We do not even question him. The white man told us he was the way and we said yes. But when has the white man ever told us something that was good for us? And that thing was really good. They say you are an African witch and so what? So what? Who told them what a witch was? Joe had finished crying, and Ma'aku scrubbed all the white salt stains along his cheek with the hem of her dress. She pulled him back into the street, dragging him along the arm and muttering the whole time. Timmy's hands were trembling, and Joe watched them shake. He was a lanky, skinny boy with soft hands that had never been burned by hot pitch or calloused by caulking iron. Timmy came from a line of free folk, born and raised in Baltimore, to parents who were also born and raised in Baltimore. If that's what Aggie wants, Joe finally said. The couple married the next month, on the morning the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. Anna sewed Agnes's dress in the night by candlelight. In the mornings, Joe would find her, bleary-eyed, blinking herself awake as she got ready to go to the Matheson house. Baby H was so big in her belly that she could no longer walk without waddling. Her feet were so swollen that when she shoved them into her work slippers, they folded bow out, back out and over, like bread that had too much yeast and could not be contained by its pan. The wedding was at Timmy's father's church, and all the female congregants had cooked a meal fit to feed a king, even though there were whispers about Timmy marrying a girl whose folks didn't attend a church, not even the rival Methodist one, across the street. Beulah stood next to Agnes in a purple dress, and Timmy's brother, John Jr., stood next to him. Timmy's father, Pastor John, married them. He didn't close the usual way, announcing the new Mr. and Mrs., telling them to kiss, but instead 
had the congregation reach their hands out towards Timmy and Agnes while he said a blessing. And just as he spoke the words, and all God's people said, a little boy ran by the door of the church shouting, The law passed! The law passed! And the answer, Amen, came muffled and insincere from some. From others, it didn't come at all. A few began to squirm in their seats, and one even left, getting up so quickly that the whole pew rocked, thrown as it was off balance. Agnes looked at Joe with a shadow of nervousness hanging behind her eyes, and he looked at her as steadily as he knew how. Then her fear melted away as the collective fear grew. Pastor John finished marrying the couple, and everyone ate the feast that Anna Ma and the rest of the women had prepared. In a couple weeks, word came in that James Hamlet, a Baltimore runaway, had been kidnapped and convicted in New York City. White folks wrote about it in the New York Herald and the Baltimore Sun. He was the first, but everyone knew there would be more. People began moving up to Canada by the hundreds. Joe went to Fells Point one week, and what used to be a sea of black faces against the backdrop of the blue-green bay had turned into nothing. Matheson had made sure Joe's whole family had their free papers together, but he knew others with papers too, and even they had fled. Matheson spoke to Joe again. I want to make certain you know what's at stake here, Joe. If they catch you, they'll take you to trial, but you won't get any kind of say at all. It'll be the white man's word against you, no word at all. You all make sure you carry your papers at all times, understand? Joe nodded. There were rallies and protests throughout the North, and not just among the, the black people. White people were joining in, like Joe had never seen them join in about anything before. The South had brought his, this fight to the Northern welcome mat, when many of them had wanted nothing to do with it. Now white people could be fined for giving a black man a meal, a job, or a place to stay. And if the law said that the black man was a runaway, and how were they supposed to know who was a runaway and who had not been a runaway? It had created an impossible situation, and those who had determined to stay on the fence found themselves without a fence at all. In the mornings, before Joe and Anna went off to work, Joe made the children practice showing their papers. He would play the federal marshal, hands on his hips, walking up to each of them, even little Gracie, and saying in a voice as stern as he could muster, Where are you going? And they would reach into their pockets that Anna had sewn onto their dresses and pants, and without any back talk, always silently, thrust those papers into Joe's hands. When he first started doing this, the children would burst into laughter, thinking it was a game. They didn't know about Joe's fear of people in uniform didn't know what it was like to lie silent and barely breathing under the floorboards of a Quaker house, listening to the sound of a catcher's boot heel stomp above you. Joe had worked so hard that his children wouldn't have to inherit this fear, but now he wished they had just the tiniest morsel of it. You worry too much, Anna said. Ain't nobody looking for them kids. Ain't nobody looking for us neither. The baby was due any day now, and Joe noticed that his wife had become crankier than ever, snapping at him for the tiniest of things. She craved fish and lemons. She walked with her hands on her lower back, and she forgot things. The keys one day, the broom the next. Joe worried she would forget her papers next. He had seen her leave them, rumpled and worn, on her side of the mattress one day when she went to the market, and he'd yelled at her for it. He'd yelled at her till she cried. Bad as he felt that day, he knew she would never forget again. Then one day, Anna didn't come home. Joe ran to the room to see if she'd left her papers again, but he couldn't find them anywhere. And he heard Anna's sweet voice saying, you worry too much, you worry too much, in his ear. Beulah came home with the rest of the kids in tow, and Joe asked if they had seen their mother. Is baby H coming, Daddy? Uriah said. Maybe, Joe said absently. Then Ma'aku came home, her hands massaging the nape of her neck. It didn't take long for her to survey the room. Where's Anna? She said. She was going to get some sardines before coming home. Ma said, but Joe was already halfway out the door. He went to the grocer, the corner store, the fabric shop. He went to the fish market, the cobbler, the hospital, the shipyards, the museum, the bank. Anna? She ain't been by today, said one after the other. Then, for the first time in his life, Joe knocked on a white man's door at night. Matheson himself opened the door. She ain't been home since morning, Joe said, his throat catching on the words. It had been a long time since he'd cried, and he didn't want to do it in front of a white man, no matter how the man had helped him. Go home to your kids, Kojo. I'll start looking for her right now. You go home. Joe nodded, and in his dazed walk home, he began to think about what life would be like without his wife, the woman he had loved hard and long. Everyone had been keeping up with what was becoming known as the bloodhound law. They'd heard about the dogs, the kidnappings, the trials. They'd heard it all. But hadn't they earned their freedom? 
the days of running through forests and living under floorboards, wasn't that the price they'd paid? Joe didn't want to accept that he was already starting to know in his heart. Anna and baby H were gone. Joe couldn't stand by and wait for Matheson to look for Anna. Matheson may have had all the wealthy white connections a person could want, but Joe knew the black and the poor immigrant white people of Baltimore, and at night, after they had finished working on the ships, he went out to talk to them, trying to gather information. But everywhere he went, the answer was the same. They had seen Anna that morning, the day before, three nights ago, the day she went missing. She had been at Matheson's till six o'clock. After that, nothing. No one had seen her. Agnes's new husband, Timmy, was a good artist. He drew up a picture of Anna from memory that looked as close to her as any Joe had ever seen. In the morning, Joe took the picture to Fell's Point with him. He got on every last boat in the shipyard, showing people Anna's face drawn in heavy charcoal. Sorry, Joe, they all said. He took the picture on to Alice with him, and even though all the other men were, knew what she looked like, they humored him, studying the picture carefully before telling Joe what he already knew. They hadn't seen her either. Joe took to carrying the picture in his back pocket while he worked. He lost himself in the sound of mallet hitting iron, that steady rhythm he knew so well. It soothed him. Then one day, when he was getting the oakum ready and the picture slipped out of his pocket, and by the time Joe caught it, the bottom edges were soaked in pine tar. As he worked to get it off, the tar stuck to his fingers, and when he reached up to wipe the sweat from his eye, his face shimmered with it. I gotta go, Joe said to Poot, waving the picture frantically, hoping the wind would dry it. You can't miss no more days, Joe. Poot said, they gonna give you job to one of them Irishmen, and then what, huh? Who gonna feed them kids, Joe? Joe was already running towards dry land. By the time Joe got to the furniture store in Alisana Street, he was showing the picture to every person he passed. He didn't know what he was thinking when he shoved it in the face of the white woman coming out of the store. Please, ma'am, he said. Have you seen my wife? I'm looking for my wife. The woman backed away from him slowly, her eyes widening with fear, but never leaving his own as though if she was to turn from him, he would be free to attack her. You stay away from me, the woman said, holding her hand out in front of her. I'm looking for my wife. Please, ma'am, just look at the picture. Have you seen my wife? She shook her head and held out hand, too. She didn't even glance at the picture once. I've got children, she said. Please don't hurt me. Was she even listening to a word he said? Suddenly, Joe felt two strong arms grab him from behind. This man bothering you? A voice asked. No, officer. Thank you, officer, the woman said, breathing easier and then taking her leave. The policeman swung Joe around to face him. Joe was so scared he couldn't lift his eyes, so he lifted instead the picture. Please, my wife, sir, she's eight months pregnant and I ain't seen her in days. Your wife, huh? The policeman said, snatching the picture from Joe's hands. Pretty N-word, ain't she? Still, Joe couldn't look at him. Why don't you let me take this picture with me? Joe shook his head. He'd almost lost the picture once that day and didn't know what he would do if he'd lost it again. Please, sir, it's the only one I got. Then, Joe heard the sound of paper tearing. He looked up to see Anna's nose and ears and strands of hair, the shredded bits of paper flying off in the wind. I'm tired of all these runaways thinking they're above the law. If your wife was a runaway, then she got what she deserved. What about you? You a runaway? I can send you on to see your wife. Joe held the policeman's gaze. His whole body felt like it was shaking. He couldn't see it, but he felt it inside of him, an unstoppable quaking. No, sir, he said. Speak up. No, sir. I was born free right here in Baltimore. The policeman smirked. Go home, he said. The policeman turned and walked away, and the quaking that had been held somewhere inside of Joe's bones started to escape till he was sitting on the hard ground trying to hold himself together. Tell him what you told me, Matheson said. Joe was standing in Matheson's parlors three, three weeks later. Ma'aku had fallen ill and could no longer go to work, but Joe still stopped by the Matheson house on his way home to see if the man had any news about Anna. This day, Matheson was holding a scared black child by his shoulders. The boy could not have been much older than, than Dally, and if he was any more scared of being called in by a white man, his skin would have been gray instead of its cool tar black. He stood, hands trembling, and looked up at Joe. I saw the white man take a pregnant woman into his carriage. Says she's too pregnant to walk home, so he takes her. Joe bent down till his eyes were level with the shaking child's. He grabbed the boy's chin in his hand and made him look at him, and he searched the boy's eyes for what seemed like days, three whole weeks to be exact, searching for Anna. They sold her, Joe said to Matheson, standing back up. 
Now, we don't know that, Joe. It could be that they had to rush medical care. Anna was rightfully free, and she was pregnant, Matheson answered, but his voice was uncertain. They had checked every hospital, every midwife, even witch doctors. No one had seen Anna or Baby H. They sold her and the baby, too, Joe said. And before he or Matheson could stop or thank him, the child pulled away and ran out of the Matheson house quicker than a flash. He would likely tell his friends all about it, being in the grand home of a white man who had been asking questions about a black woman. He would make himself sound better in them. He would say he stood tall and spoke firmly, that the man shook his hand after and offered him a quarter. We'll keep looking, Joe, Matheson said, observing the empty space the boy had left behind. This isn't over. We'll find her. I'll go to court if I have to, Joe. I promise you that. Joe couldn't hear him anymore. The wind was coming in through the door. The child had left ajar. It was moving around the big white pillars that held up the house, curving around them, bending until it fit into the thin space of Joe's ear canal. It was there to tell him that fall had come into Baltimore and that he would have to spend it alone, taking care of his ailing ma and his seven children without his Anna. Then he went home. The kids were all waiting. Agnes had come over with Timmy. The girl was pregnant, Joe could just tell, but he knew that she was scared to tell him or to hurt or him or the three-week-old memory of her mother. Scared, her small piece of joy was almost shameful. Joe, Ma'aku called. Joe had given her the bedroom once her pain had started worsening. He went to her. She was lying on her back, staring up at the ceiling, her hands folded over her chest. She turned her head toward him and spoke in twee, something she used to do often when he was a child, but she had stopped almost completely since he married Anna. She's gone? Ma asked, and Joe nodded. She sighed. You will make it through this, Joe. And Yame did not make weak Ashantis, and that is what you are. No matter what man here, white or black, wishes to erase that part of you, your mother came from strong, powerful people, people who do not break. You're my mother, Joe said. And Ma'aku, with great effort, turned her whole body toward him and opened her arms. Joe crawled into bed with her and cried as he rested his head on her bosom, as he had not done since he was a young child. Back then, he used to cry for Sam and Ness. The only thing that would pacify him was stories about them, even if the stories were unpleasant. So Ma'aku would tell him that Sam hardly spoke, but when he did, it was loving and wise, and that Ness had some of the most gruesome whip scars she had ever seen. Joe used to worry that his family line had been cut off, lost forever. He would never truly know who his people were and who their people were before them, and if there were stories to be heard about where he had come from, he would never hear them. When he felt this way, Ma'aku would hold him against her, and instead of stories about families, she would tell him stories about nations, the Fantis of the coast, the Ashantis of the inland, and the Akins. When he lay against this woman now, he knew he belonged to someone, and that once had been enough for him. Ten years passed. Ma'aku passed with them. Agnes had three children. Beulah was pregnant, and Cato and Felicity were married. Urias and Gracie, the youngest of the bunch, both found live-in work as soon as they could. They said it was to take to help take off some of the burden, but Joe knew the truth. His children could not stand to be around him anymore, and though he hated to admit it, he could not stand to be around them. The problem was Anna. The fact that he saw her everywhere, in Baltimore, at every shop, on every road. He would sometimes see ample buttocks coming around the corner and follow them for blocks on end. He'd gotten slapped once doing this. It was winter, and the woman, so light her skin looked like cream, with just a drop of coffee, had turned a corner and waited for him there. Slapped him so quick, he didn't even notice who had done it, till she turned back around and seen that generous swish of her hips. He went to New York. It didn't matter what he had become, one of the best ship caulkers in the Chesapeake Bay area had ever seen. He couldn't look at a boat again. He couldn't pick up a chisel or smell oakum or hemp or tar without thinking about the life he once had. The woman and the children he had once had, and the thought too much. In New York, he did whatever work he could do, mostly carpentry, plumbing when he could get it, though he was often underpaid. He rented a bedroom from an elderly black woman who cooked his meals and did his laundry unbidden. Most nights he spent at the all-black bar. He came in one blustery December day and sat down in his usual spot, running his hand over the smooth wood of the bar. The workmanship was impeccable. He had always suspected that some black man had done it, perhaps during his first days of freedom in New York, so happy that he was able to do something for himself, rather than for someone else that he put his whole heart into it. The bartender, a man with almost imperceptible limp, poured Joe his drink before Joe could even ask for it and set it down. 
The man sitting next to him was whipped that morning, or sorry, whipped out that morning's paper, now crumpled, wet from the damp bar or the few slung drops of the man's drink. South Carolina seceded today, the man said, to no one in particular, and getting no particular response, he looked up from the paper and glanced around at a few of the people who were in there. War's coming. The bartender started wiping down the bar with a rag that looked to Joe to be dirtier than the bar itself. There won't be a war, he said calmly. Joe had been hearing talk of war for years. It didn't mean much to him. He tried to veer away from conversation whenever he could, leery of southern sympathizers in the north, or worse, overly enthusiastic white northerners who wanted him to be angrier and louder, to defend himself and his right to freedom. But Joe wasn't angry. Not anymore. Couldn't really tell if he had what he'd been before he was angry. It was an emotion he had no use for. That accomplished nothing and meant less than that. If anything, what Joe really felt was tired. I'm telling you, this is a bad sign. One southern state secedes, and the rest of them are going to follow. Can't call us the United States of America if half the states are gone. You mark my words. War's coming. The bartender rolled his eyes. I'm not marking a thing, and unless you've got money for another drink, I think it's time for you to stop marking and get going. The man huffed loudly as he rolled his paper in his hand. As he walked by, he tapped Joe on the shoulder with it, and when Joe turned to look at him, he winked, as if he and Joe were on the same scheme together, as though they knew something the rest of the world didn't. But Joe couldn't figure out what that could possibly be.